The views and opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of Access for Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting groups. If you'd like to produce a show, call us at 260-421-1250. This is Patty Hunter of Patty's Page. Today we have a special guest on Messenger on the computer, Dr. William Lyle. My other guest over here is uh, president of the Lutherans for Life of uh, Fort Wayne chapter. So, Dr. Lyle, we're interviewing you because you're coming here within a month. So we have questions for you, my dear, to talk about that. Sure. Well, Karen, what would you like to say? Well, I, I realize, Dr. Lyle, you've been making these presentations for some 19 years, which is quite remarkable in itself. I was just wondering, how do you keep this motivation going to do this? I mean, literally, it's a matter of life or death. Um, you know, we treat the preborn as patients every day in our office. We can actually give blood transfusions to babies as early as 19 weeks gestation. I've delivered, during my career, I've delivered almost 4,000 babies now. Mm. Yet when I see that here in the state of Florida, we'll have oh, over 70,000 lives of tiny babies taken, it's a matter of life or death. And so it's a matter of education, it's a matter of showing the personhood and doing the best that we can to defend the life of the you know, inside of the womb. The uh, abortion uh, pill, re uh, what do you call it, reverse? Abortion pill reversal? Reversal. Sure. Um, you know, about 15 to 20 percent of all abortions of pregnancies now are done as medical abortions, mm -hmm. where surgery involved, where there are two primary choices of medications available to the abortionist. The first is a medication called RU486. It's an anti-progesterone medication. Progesterone is the medication, is the, the hormone in the body. Progesterone, progestation. It tells the body, let's, hey, we're pregnant, let's keep the pregnancy going. RU46 blocks that hormone. So the body literally will say, my goodness, I could have sworn we were pregnant. And now we're not pregnant because I'm not getting that signal. Yeah. Well, we can burst that medication, RU46. The second abortion medication is a medication called methotrexate. Met methotrexate is actually a chemotherapy that's used in other forms of medicine. It's used for different GYN cancers, so, such as a choriocarcinoma. Sometimes it's used to treat different arthritises. Um, but it's also a medication that is used to attack a developing baby. The first medication, RU46, we can actually reverse that by using high-dose progesterone. So if the hormone that's being blocked is progesterone, we just overwhelm the body with exogenous additional progesterone to let the body know, yes, you are, are pregnant. The second medication, uh, methotrexate, we actually can reverse that kind of a sooner we're involved, the better, but we can reverse that with a medication called Leucoborn. Leucoborn is actually FDA approved for reversing any toxic effects of the medication methotrexate. Just in this past year, I've had one patient who had chosen to get an abortion. She was given that medication to you know, the Mobile, Alabama methotrexate, and then immediately had regrets. Didn't sleep at all that night, got a hold of us through abortionpillreversal.com and when she got a hold of us we were able to get in touch with her, counsel her extensively and then be able to find a pharmacy that carried that medication and we started on the medicine Luca Warren. We saw her in the office a week later 
We had an eight-week baby with positive fetal heart tones, and we saw her in the office two weeks later, and again, we had positive fetal heart tones. We had our maternal fetal medicine specialist here several times. We saw her on a weekly basis, and in about 39 weeks, we developed, we delivered a healthy baby girl. The second patient was actually pregnant with twins. Yeah. She given the medication RU446. And then she came into our ER bleeding and cramping, but we did an ultrasound. Both babies still had a positive heartbeat. So we counseled her, and when she saw the heartbeat of both babies still there, she goes, is there anything I can do to try to protect my baby from the medication that was given to me at the abortion clinic? And we said, yes, there is. So we counseled her, and we put her on high-dose progesterone. And when we last saw her, she was about 14 weeks along, and both babies were doing great. Mm -hmm. We have a big narcotic problem here in the United States. Last year, we had over... 70,000 people who died from narcotic overdoses. Well, if somebody shows up in my emergency room and they made a bad decision and they overdosed on narcotics, we give them a medication called Narcan. Narcan will reverse the effects of the narcotic and all of a sudden they are back there talking to you, they are conscious and it saves their life. They made a bad decision, but we help them with that bad decision and we reverse the effects of the narcotic. The thing when somebody attempts a medical abortion, whether it's RU46 or whether it's methotrexate, they made a bad decision. They regret that decision. And they come to us saying, I made a bad decision. Is there anything I can do to help reverse the bad decision I just made? So we have documented over 100 pregnancies just nationwide in the United States where we have reversed the medical abortion with RU46 being used and reversed it with progesterone. And just in the past year, I've had a singleton where we reversed methotrexate, and I have a set of twins that we reversed, you know, from taking RU46 by giving them progesterone. You're coming here to Fort Wayne, Indiana, October, yeah. October five, five six, and seven. October, yes, ma'am. Five. Oh, I'll be speaking at multiple different venues. We'll be talking about how we treat the preborn as patients. We'll talk about abortion pill reversals, and we'll talk about abortion itself, how it's affecting our society and our communities. And I'll be available to answer any questions that people have about how we treat the preborn as patients, or about abortion, or what can be done to reverse this effect in the United States. So, what prompted you to become a doctor of this? Uh, well, I, was, I spent several you know, years in hospitals having different surgeries and procedures done when I was a kid, whether it was an appendix or whether it was plastic surgery or tumors removed. And so I really developed a respect for the plastic surgeons and the medical community that dealt with me as a child. And then in college, I you know, had this desire to pursue it. I went to medical school not planning to be an obstetrician and gynecologist, but when I would go on my rotations, you know, on things like orthopedic surgery or general surgery or geriatrics or infectious disease, I always found myself doing casual reading about obstetrics and gynecology. One of my professors said, if you find yourself reading about a certain discipline, when you're not even on that rotation. That's probably a good you know, indication that that's what you are being called to do. So I did my residency at the University of Florida in obstetrics and gynecology and went into private practice after I finished my residency. You know, I'm excited to come to Fort Wayne, Indiana. You know, there are a lot of pro-life you know, colleagues that are up there in the Fort Wayne area. Mm -hmm. You know, Lutheran's is an admirable group that does a lot to educate and to protect the lives of the pre-born. And I'm going to be coming up there, speaking at several different venues for the weekend, and I'm honored to be able to come up there. I'm looking forward to it. We will be going from one event to another, speaking to lots of different people. We invite you out. I promise you will learn a lot, and we'll also be available to answer any questions that you have as far as how you can become more involved. So we'll be having young kids in public school, I do believe, confirmants, and as well as teenagers coming. 
and their and their uh, parents. We hope so. I mean, we you know when it comes to the age. I mean, obviously, I've delivered patients so as young as fourteen. Mm. Uh, a lot of patients who are sexually active, and we treat a lot of their issues in thirteen, fourteen, fifteen years of age. So it is a topic that we discuss and present in a sensitive way, in a age appropriate way. When we talk about abortion, it is not my goal ever to use the more graphic pictures of abortion. My emphasis is showing how we treat the preborn as patients within the womb by using ultrasound, by using MRIs, showing the life that's within the womb. When somebody wants, we can discuss how an abortion actually is. But when I've looked at videos of patients who've been shown the more graphic abortion videos that are available out there, what I would see was heads are down, eyes are closed, fingers are in the ears. That's not how you educate people. You know, so I want to show and emphasize the life in the womb. We can discuss the actual mechanics of an abortion. I don't use any graphic pictures. We just use instruments and we just say, this is how it's done. You've seen the life within the womb. Now we can talk about how that life is taken. And I want to educate people. I don't want them with their fingers in their ears and closing their eyes. I want them to be open. I want them to listen to the truth and then make their decisions based on the truth that's presented. So it's age appropriate for anybody who would want to come to our presentations. Terrific. Yeah, you were talking about how life was created? Sure. I mean, we can, we'll actually be presenting video of when an egg and a sperm get together at that moment of fertilization where there is a visible flash of light. And you watch fertilization occur with the right wavelength of light, you can see a flash of light. A lot of people have done the 23andMe or the ANSET ancestrydna.com and it's amazing what you can find out about yourself. I did the ancestry.com. I found out I'm 23% French, I'm 40% Irish, I'm 30% this, 5%, 2%, and I look and see where my ancestors live. But what's also interesting is that based on my DNA, ancestry.com has had over 2 million people send their DNA in to be analyzed and to be tested. They could actually tell me where people with similar DNA as myself live here in the United States. They wouldn't give any personal information. My family, my mom's side of the family is all from up in the New Jersey, Virginia area. My father's side of the family is all from Mississippi and Arkansas. When Ancestry.com looked at my DNA profile and identified hundreds of people with similar DNA profiles, or actually my relatives that I just don't know about. There were scores of dots up in the New Jersey and Virginia area, and there were scores of little dots down in the Arkansas, North Mississippi area. Ancestry.com doesn't know where my grandparents lived and where my father's grandparents lived, but they were able to find my relatives. Well, when did that whole story start? When did that story of all of my five, ten, 15 generations that they can study in the DNA. When did that go back to, and where are my current relatives? Where did that story happen? You know, my dad's side of the story was his side of the story. My mom's side of the story was her side of the story. But that union with all of these hundreds of relatives and all these tens of generations that go back didn't happen when I was born. You don't just all of a sudden, when you come out of the womb, all of a sudden you have that genetic family history. All of that happened at one time, and that was at that moment of conception. That's when that sort of story started. The story of my dad's side of the family, my mom's side of the family, all getting together. So when I look at Ancestry.com and I send my DNA, like millions of people have done, just to find out more about their background. When I look at that analysis, that story doesn't start when I was born. That story actually goes back to that moment of conception when those two sides of the family came together as one. And we have to show, well, I mean, not show, but yeah, show people that that 
babies be, while in the womb are alive and human. Oh yeah, we can see the baby's heart beating within the womb about 28 days after conception. Mm. We minor surgeries on babies. We give blood transfusions. Well, there are conditions where a baby will have a very low blood count. And if we don't do something about that, the baby will die within the womb. It used to be that to see what the baby's blood count was, we'd have to stick a needle in around the baby and sometimes even in the umbilical vein itself to see what the baby's blood, excuse me, blood count was. Now, with ultrasound technology, we can measure what's called the uh, velocity, the speed, the Doppler velocity and feed of individual red blood cells going through a real small blood vessel in the baby's brain. It's called the middle cerebral artery. And we can then, based on the speed of those blood vessels, we can tell if the baby is anemic or not. Mm. Then we make the decision on giving the baby a blood transfusion. Why is the baby's blood count so low? Well, because the mom has antibodies which are attacking the baby. But why would the mom have antibodies attacking the baby? Well, only half the baby's genetics is from the mom. The other half of the baby's genetics come from the dad. So the mom is actually seeing the baby is born. So when some, a pregnant woman says, it's my body, I'll do with it what I want to, actually, her body is an amazing host for the different person, the little body that's there inside of her. We can actually take blood that if you went down to your Red Cross blood donation center and you happen to have O negative blood, that, that's the kind of adult donated blood that we use to give blood transfusions to the babies on the inside of the womb. Mm -hmm. We'll do that as early as 19 weeks. That's a month before a baby could even survive. Sometimes we have to do that transfusion every month, sometimes every six to eight weeks. But if we don't treat that baby as a patient on the inside of the womb, that patient would die. So a patient is a person, no matter how small they are, they're a patient and they're a new person from that moment of conception. We see the heart beating, we can do diagnostic tests, and now we're getting to the point where not only can we do testing on the baby, but we can treat the baby as well with different surgeries, with different medications, and with blood transfusions. Wow. Uh have you made any observations about the various audiences that you have presented to over the years in terms of their age or the questions they ask you, that sort of thing? They, they really vary. Um, a lot of the audience is in their 60s and 70s, and they've been fighting against abortion since 1973. But then we have a new generation of teenagers and college students. A lot of them are involved in Students for Life, an organization where this new generation is realizing that this is a person that's there on the inside. This new generation is very visually oriented. They see videos on YouTube, they see videos on their cell phone, they see them on their laptops and on their tablets. That's how they learn. And when they see us doing surgery on a baby on the inside, or they see the babies jumping and sliding on the inside, babies having hiccups, babies smiling, we have 3D ultrasound, we have MRI images, and it's no longer that you can just say it's just a blob of tissue on the inside. It's not a person there on the inside. I have an MRI, a moving MRI image of a baby that's in the womb that's trying to stretch and move, and you actually see that baby standing up while in the womb. There are a lot of states, in fact, New Jersey, where I'm from, is one of them, where there is no gestational age cap an abortion can be performed all the way through the mm -hmm. pregnancy, legally mm -hmm. out of up. And even though this is a person from the moment of conception, when people see how we treat the preborn as patients on the inside, and they realize that that life can also be taken by an abortion, especially the younger generation with their visual learning techniques, they say, this is wrong. This is not a blob of tissue. This is a little person there on the inside. It's smiling at me. It has facial expressions. It's moving its eyes, its fingers, and its hands. It's a person there on the inside. We're actually starting to have babies in the womb delivered at a very early gestational age, and they're surviving better than they used to. It used to be unusual to have a baby at 28 weeks gestation survive. And 
It's become routine to have 25 week babies survive. We just had a baby that was delivered in our area that just graduated from the uh, neonatal intensive care unit in Mobile, Alabama. That was 22 weeks. Wow. Mm. He's doing great. I have, a, yeah. I have a question. There's some doctors or nurses that if they abort the baby and the baby's still alive, they left it to die. That, that has to be changed. Yeah, and uh, that happens. It is wrong. But, you know, the key is uh, there was a lot of legislation talking about partial birth abortion ban. And it got a lot of attention, and people said, yeah, we can't do that. Well, when the states banned partial birth abortions, all they did was ban that particular procedure, that way of taking the life of the baby. It would be like, we're going to pass a law that says you can't kill somebody with a firearm. Well, what about stabbing them to death? No, this law doesn't cover that. You just can't kill somebody with a firearm. Our legislative body, which is called ACON, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, age, actually came out with a practice bulletin telling us how to practice medicine, what the standard of care would be. And they say, yes, with this new legislation, you cannot take the life of a baby by a partial birth abortion. However, if the life of the baby is taken within the womb first, then you can deliver the baby any way you want. And they actually listed three different ways that they recommended taking the life of the baby. One, by injecting the baby with potassium chloride mm. into the heart. Yeah. And that's a medication that is actually used in uh, uh, you know, lethal injections for somebody who's been convicted of murder. Or injecting the baby with a medication called digoxin, which is a very strong heart medication, which would stop the baby's heart. Or they said by cutting the baby's umbilical cord, which is the life connection between the mom and the baby. So the laws specifically addressed one particular type of, of abortion, a partial birth abortion. The laws did not address protecting the life of the baby within the womb. And then my governing body actually came out and said, well, yeah, you can't do a partial birth abortion on a baby that is still alive. However, these are the three ways we recommend taking the life of the baby and then you can do, then do the partial birth abortion procedure because the baby is no longer alive. And so our legislators need to be very cognizant of that effect. You know, I've you know, given testimony you know, to different legislators when they've been working on legislation that would protect the lives of the unborn. And what's important is that we not ban a particular procedure because that's just like saying killing somebody with a firearm is illegal well, what about stabbing them or choking them? Now we didn't address that. The important thing our legislation needs to do is address the life within the womb and protecting the life, not the manner in which that life is taken. Aye, aye. And toward, towards the end of our interview, Karen, what would you like to say? Well, we thank you very much for your time. Uh, oh, we're, absolutely. we're keeping your patient in our prayers, of course. And, and you as well, and we hope you, you don't suffer from this wild hurricane weather that you have down there. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking outside the window and the trees are blowing, the rain is coming, but that's just what the price to pay for sure. rain in Canada. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> price to pay. Oh my goodness. Well, listen, we love you, man, and we'll see you in October 5th, 6th, and 7th. All right, God bless you all. Have a wonderful evening. God bless. God bless you too. Uh, Happy anniversary. Our rich crop. Thank you, ma'am. Y'all have a great night. <laughs> Bye. Bye, dear. God speed, my love, until we meet again. You're always in my heart and every dream. Don't let this time apart give in to all our God will keep us close from up above So until we meet again God speak my love God is with us always for the rest of our lives